Welcome to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. My name is Ed Holinsky. Glad you could join us today. We've got another great guest here today. His name is Mike Fisker. Family name is very familiar in North Tonawanda circles and in football circles in North Tonawanda. Mike played at Bishop Gibbons, but better yet, he was a football official, Western New York football official and college official, and he's celebrating 40 years this year. Mike, glad you could join me today here on, on the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. How's things in your world these days? Not too bad. We're just finishing up on our fall spring season for high school football, which uh, because of COVID, they had to move it back to the spring and stuff. So we're just about finishing up. Uh, I got a sectional game on Friday night in Medina between Medina and Eden. So it should be a pretty good game. We'll get back to that, your, your officiating career, because that's simply amazing in and of itself. But I want to talk about growing up Pisker and your, your dad being the great Roman Pisker, uh, 1968 North Tonawanda Football Hall of Famer, played pro football for, if I remember right, the New York Yankees football, Cleveland Browns, and also the Chicago franchise as well, too. Yeah. Um, how was it growing up with a with a father with that type of uh, resume? Well, it was good. You know, my dad always filled us in on stuff that was going on, but he was a true believer that we shouldn't be playing football until we're in high school. He had this thing about the kids being young and apparently maybe he had seen some of the little league games. And I guess he didn't like the way some of the coaches were coaching and stuff like that. And he figured that once we get to high school, uh, physically, we should be okay, and mentally, we should be okay too, to where we can get going and move on. Did he ever share any of his uh, college days at Niagara, or uh, you know, playing pro football? Uh, he did a little bit. Um, he really did. He downplayed it because he wanted us to do what we had to do. I know. I after graduation at uh, Gibbons, I went to U University of Utah for two years on a scholarship till I screwed up his shoulder. And one of his uh, buddies from Niagara was there, uh, uh, Mr. Aloya. And, uh, you know, he kind of filled me in a little bit of what my dad did and stuff. But my dad was always quiet about it. You know, he just said, hey, you know, you guys got to do what you got to do. And that went along with my two brothers, too. We were both at Gibbons until their end of their sophomore year. I graduated and then they went on to NT. Gary and Greg, my brothers. How was it? Uh, were you guys competitive when you were you, uh, teenagers? Uh, in a way, but my brothers were younger. I mean, I was a lot bigger than they were. They were D-backs and halfbacks, and I was a fullback or a nose guard, you know, something like that. But we were competitive, but uh, like I said, they were a little smaller than I was. What do you recall about those Gibbon football days? Uh Practices were pretty good most of the time. I mean, you know, I remember going down to Olean and playing at Archbishop Walsh, which I think they're still open, but I don't know if they're playing football. We went to Menzeni, which is closed right now. We went to St. Mary's of Lancaster, which is still in the uh, Catholic League. Uh, we went out to uh, DeSales in Lockport, which is closed now. I mean, it's a uh, elementary school now. And then we would go out to Notre Dame and Batavia, which is still part of Section 5, I believe. They're still playing football. They're still open, and it looks like the Notre Dame campus. I mean, that's, it's, it's a beautiful school right there. Who were some of the guys that you played with over at Gibbons? Uh, Bill Niso, um, Carl Ziegler, um, Ronnie Buckles. Uh, um, who else was there? Uh, Hmm, trying to think of all the guys now. Whitehead played with Whitehead, played with uh, Serbinsky, John Serbinsky. Uh, ahead of us were the McCarthy's, Bill and Bugsy. And uh, I remember way ahead of us, uh, be, uh, maybe before we got in, was uh, Sarkovitz, which is the AD out at uh, Star Point. So yeah. there were a lot of guys, a lot of guys that played there. And then we all remember how Ed Harmon left Gibbons. I believe he went to Louisville and then he ended up on Dallas. Uh, and then and I so, believe he had, it was went to Cincinnati as well too, for a little bit. Yes. But he, I think he, he went to Dallas first and I think he may have gone to Cincinnati after, but that was one of the pros that came out of Gibbons. 
What type of offense did you run at Gibbons and what was your impression of, uh, of uh, the play back then in the Catholic League? The play was pretty good. I mean, we would run, you know, we went from a T to a split to, uh, you know, uh, traps and stuff, which was really good. But we were kind of power football. I know uh, when our quarterback was uh, Whitehead, you know, we did some passing and stuff like that. But we were kind of a ground gainers, you know. And the teams we played against were mainly that, too. We didn't have a lot of passing and stuff going on. Okay. From my memory, at least. But that was 50 years ago. (laughs) Fair enough. What year did you get into officiating? And better yet, why did you get into officiating? Well, the story goes, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pacinis. They were in North Tonawanda, too. Charlie and uh, his brother. His brother ended up out at Roy Hart, and Charlie was the coach at Eden for a number of years. And what had happened was I went to the funeral of, I believe it was their father, I'm not sure now, and I bumped into Dick Leas and Ed Burns. Uh, Dick Leas is the president, was the president of the Western New York Certified Football Officials, and Don Burns was the secretary treasurer. And I started talking to him, and they said, hey, uh, how would you like to start uh, officiating football? I said, gee, I'd love to do that. I really would. So uh, I think it was in August of 81, I lost my dad on a Friday. And my first uh, on-field performance was on a Saturday before the funeral. So, uh, you know, that's basically how it started. And I worked, I was working at the time and we were able to work around my schedule and stuff so I could get enough games in. Plus, you know, when you first start out, you have to do so many years of Little League football. I remember working at the Tonawanda Clinic in Tonawanda. I remember going to to Pendleton, to Star Point, to Wilson, to Lockport to do Little League games because you had to get a base of so many games before you could move in to uh, a permanent um, candidate, you know, candidate, associate, and then a permanent uh, official stuff. It sounds almost like an apprentice program that you need to go through. Is that a fair assertion? Yeah, basically you start out as a candidate and then it's associate one, two, three, and then a full member. So it takes you about four years to get to a full member. And then later, then you've done, do you even recall how many, how many high school games you've officiated in? Nah, not off the top of my head, but I remember working with guys like, uh, Ronnie Nowakowski from North Tonawanda, Art Avery from North Tonawanda, uh, Maddie Sadlowski, who was the AD at Maryvale, and uh, even uh, Blakesley from uh, Lewiston Porter. I remember doing a, a freshman game with him one time. And, uh, you know, all the guys I worked with, you know, up and down. A lot of guys are gone now. How about Bruce Hoffman? I worked with Bruce. Um, he, uh, let's see, Bruce was with us and then he, he finally retired a couple of years or a number of years ago. I think when his son went to, uh, what was it, Duke or North Carolina on a swimming scholarship or something because he wanted to see some of those games, I guess, or, or events and stuff. And along with him was Joe Jastrzemski at the time, too, who's the Niagara County clerk now. Joe was part of our group, too. Actually, he, his mom and dad still live at the end of Linwood down here. Or his, pardon me, his dad lives there. His mom passed away already. Mark Winters was another one that we worked with. And Mark was the chief of police in Tonawanda. And he always used to laugh back and forth because he said, he'd look at me and he'd go, oh, you went to Gibbons. He said, I went to Tonawanda. But I think North Tonawanda beat him a few times. So, you know, but Mark has passed too. You got into officiating probably in your late 20s, early 30s. And you're now you're celebrating 40 years of it. Um, what would you tell? Is it too late for anyone to, to get into officiating? Uh, the best thing to do is try to get in in your 20s. Because after you have, we used to have a standard where you had to have 25 varsity games before uh, Division three or college would look at you to move up into college and stuff. And the thing is, sometimes it depends how your family comes along, too. Because, you know, as you start having kids and stuff, you have a commitment to take care of them at home. 
and not to be officiating. So, you know, if somebody would want to come into it in their mid twenties, that would be great. You know, how did you juggle that, that uh, family balance between that and, and officiating? Well, sometimes my wife wasn't too happy with it <laughs> because I'd have games and stuff. And even, even at work, sometimes I turned down overtime to do a game because it was a big game, you know? And so you kind of work it back and forth. And when I got into college, it was even worse because uh, I was uh, still working at Lindy and stuff and trying to get everything done that I could get done. And my kids were starting to grow up. And when I was in college, my son, Paul, was at NT playing football. So I believe his senior year, because of my schedule and stuff, I got to see maybe six of his varsity games because I wasn't scheduled to do any other games. I was working either on a, a Saturday or, you know, during the week sometime. But I wanted to see his games, too. So that was kind of hard to juggle that back and forth, too. In your estimation, who was the best football player you've ever seen in Western New York? Oh, there's been a lot of good ones, you know. Um, I mean, lately I've been seeing some real good uh, backs in the city of Buffalo because they were able to come into Section 6 because for the longest time the city schools were all in um, the Connolly Cup. They did that for years. And when they came into Section 6, we saw a lot of good players come out of uh, – you know, uh, the city Buffalo schools, they finally got the opportunity to shine all through Western New York. But I mean, I've seen kids, you know, that have gone on to college, you know, had games, either we were doing the falls or we, we were doing Jamestown or something like that. We've seen kids come up and do well. Can't remember all their names because when you're doing 20 or so games a season, it's, it's hard sometimes to keep it all in intact but I can tell you one thing I said when I was doing little league we had a player from uh, Grand Island Tutwiler remember coach Tutwiler Tutwiler was at uh, Kenmore West and they lived on Grand Island so he had his son there in little league then I remember having his son when he played at Grand Island then I ran into Tut coach Tutwiler when I was doing a game at Cortland where his son played too so it was like three areas that I had witnessed his son playing quarterback and stuff. So that, you know, that's just a little something, but over a 40 year career, career, you see some of that stuff. How do you manage to uh, avoid getting hurt? Because these guys uh, come flying and your head, apparently your head is on a swivel at all times. It is. And I think the last two years, uh, I've been decked a few times already. I think this year I got, I got uh, decked so far, I think it was four times. And one was like a ricochet where a kid blocked a kid and I was watching the play go towards my left and he kind of hit me and knocked me over. Then, uh, let's see, Friday night or Friday night? No, Saturday night when we were at Wilson, we had Wilson and Akron. The scrum just came right towards me and I'm backing up, backing up, backing up. All of a sudden I'm hitting guys coming in into the scrum, you know, so that kind of knocked me over. But other than that, uh, you know, I always tell, and I always tell people that when I first started at Gibbons, we had leather helmets. So we really never realized what a concussion was, but we had leather helmets. We just get back up and get moving, you know. I mean, times have changed when it comes to safety nowadays. On the college level, you mentioned Cortland. What are some of the other schools that you've uh, officiated games at? Or, or well, normally, normally in um, in football, when I started in football in '91, um, we would go to Alfred, Buff State, Hobart, uh, St. John Fisher, uh, U of R. We'd go to uh, St. Lawrence up in Canton, and then. Uh, Towards the end of my career, we went uh, to some schools in Pennsylvania and Allentown, Lewisburg, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, for clock operation, I've done, I got into clock around 2008 because uh, my college, what was happening is uh, my ankle, I had to have an ankle fused because it was kind of had a lot of, a lot of play in it. 
So I got off the field in 2008 in college. And then I went, I started to fish or I started doing the clock at UB and then I would work UB games. I would work games um, at uh, Cornell. I would work games at Colgate. And then I'd be, I'd be juggling their division with my division three schools. So, you know, one week I could be at St. John Fisher. The next week I'm down at Colgate week after I'm up at Canton at St. Lawrence. And then I'm down to Col. I'm down to Cornell. And uh, when we had in college, when we had the, the freshman program at uh, I think I forget what they called the program exactly. We'd been to Cornell a number of times to do games, you know, like Cornell against army, Cornell against Navy, Cornell against Princeton because they have that lower weight range that they play. And uh, that Cornell stadium, it's got that, it's like a, it's like a Coliseum almost on the one side. It's all concrete and everything. And the other side, I think their stands are falling apart. They're working on that. But those were some of the places that I had officiated. So, and then I had a couple of division uh, three playoff games. We were down in Pennsylvania a couple of times. We were at Westfield in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, where else were we? We were somewhere else too. So, and I've had over the years, I've had a number of uh, Division three playoff games, like at Alfred, at Brockport. You know, when they had good seasons and stuff. So it's nice. It's nice to do the clock. And I'm just about finishing my high school career because I wanted to get my 40 years in. So this fall, actually, if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have finished last season. <laughs> That was but gonna be my that was gonna be my next question. How long are you going to continue being an official? I mean, it, it sounds like the, the the clock operation is is a pretty good uh, deal for you going forward. Well, it is because it keeps your mind going. And you know, I was a college official, so I know all the rules there. And it kind of keeps me active and you can talk to the crew and you know get along with everybody. But high school is just getting to a point now where you know, I've had both shoulders replaced. I've had a knee replacement. I've had an ankle fused. And the last time I was to my orthopedic, he said, you know, if you keep this up, you're going to need a hip replaced. And I said, well, if I have to get a hip replaced, that's totally out because I won't go back on the field. A knee, you can one knee you can get away with because you can kind of protect it, you know. But uh, I'm just getting to that point. The other thing is that is kids are getting harder and harder to deal with. Coaches are even getting worse. I mean, years ago, you had a coach, he'd say something, he'd go back to a fish or he'd go back to coaching. Nowadays, they just kind of keep complaining. And then once a coach complains, then you see the team starting to act up, you know, and then before you know it, you just got chaos, you know. Uh, is there a standard operating procedure on how to try to get a game under control when you can run into circumstances like that? Yeah, normally you do. Like as an umpire, I tell the guys to stand down. I said, listen, stand down, gentlemen, calm down, relax. And if I do, if I do get two guys going at it, I try to, we're not supposed to, but I try to get between them. And I said, you know, guys, if you keep it up and somebody throws a punch and the other guy throws a punch, you're on the sidelines. Your coach is not going to be happy with you. You know, and in high school football, even on unsportsmanlike convicts, UNSs, you get two of them and you're out, you're gone, you know, and if you eject a kid, in section six, I believe he's ejected for the rest of the game and like the first half of the next game. So, you know, kids got to really think about it, about getting, you know, ejected out of a game and stuff. And sometimes coaches, honest, Ed, I have to bite my tongue. I really have to bite my tongue because they just get carried away, you know, and you tell them, coach, I've heard you. I understand it, but I didn't see it that way. I looked at it in a different way, you know, and you just try to do the best you can because in Western New York varsity games, we only have four officials. So we have four guys looking at 22 people all the time. If we do a modified game, we only have three officials, you know, and every once in a while we'll get a fifth official, which is a back judge and he can dead ball officiate behind the crew and everything to watch everything that's going on. But some States have six officials for high school. They have seven officials for high school. When I started college, we only had five and I was a back judge. And now they're up to seven officials, you know, where you have two, you have your line officials, your deep officials and your back judge. How much do you hear from the stands, from the parents? You talked about the, 
you talk about the coaches complaining, and I'm sure there's some good one-liner and zingers that, that come flying out of the stands from parents to you. Normally, though, Ed, you, you tune it out. You just tune it out, you know, and because people, parents are worried about their kids all the time. And, you know, they're, say, 200 feet away from a play, and they're trying to tell you what happened when you see something different. Like the other day, we had a person yell for a horse collar, which, if you know, it's a pull from the side or a pull from the back. All the kid had was a jersey. He didn't have a physical horse collar. Or people yell about a face mask. But a hand and a release is nothing. It's got to grab it and turn it to get something. People look at that. Pass interference is always a big thing. But, you know, they'll say, oh, he was face guarding. Well, in high school, you can face guard now, you know. But they see stuff on TV, and then they try to bring it into high school. Same thing with kids now. As the umpire, I have to look at all the equipment on everybody. We have people with the things on their arms, you know, the Lance Armstrong things. And then we got guys that don't want to wear knee pads, you know, because they see on college and, and pros that the pants are pulled up, you know. And a big thing is the colored shields, you know, like the dark shields. You can't have those because if a kid would have a concussion, you can't see the eyes or anything because of that shield. And if a kid goes down, you don't want to pull the helmet off of them because they always try to, you know, retain everything till they get to the hospital and they let them take them from there. So, you know, it is what it is. We try to do the best we can. We try to see everything we can. And a lot of times people will yell about a hold, but if the holds on that side of the field and the runner is over here, it's, it's not at the point of contact and people don't understand that. Is there any, is there a, a, such a thing as a makeup call? They say that all the time, but, you know, to be honest, honesty up. If a team is up 99 to nothing, you can bet the way the old timers were, there'd be holds. If they were up 99 to nothing, there'd be a hold here and there, you know, and that's how they were because they didn't feel that it was fair to push a team right into the ground by, you know, just keep scoring on them and not pulling your first team out and stuff like that. But guys nowadays, they don't look at it that way. It is what it is. You know, if the second team's in and they score a touchdown, so be it. Not a problem, you know, or the third team. That's how we look at it. What's the toughest game to officiate? Is it a blowout? Is it a, is it a tight game? Is it in inclement uh, weather conditions? Ed, the weather really isn't bad. The score is what dictates the problem. I've had games that were 12 and 12 or, or 12 and 14 or something like that. They were the best games I ever officiated. The hard ones are the blowouts because if you're really beating a team bad, those guys that are being beat bad, they start to lose their focus and they start to push and shove and talk or the guys that are doing the, you know, 45 to nothing, they start pointing down or a kid will say something. They'll say, hey, look at the scoreboard. Look what it is. You guys aren't doing anything. You don't even want to play. And a lot of times you have to get into their face right away and say, listen, guys, we're here to play football. We're not here to talk. OK, let's get going. Let's get moving. You know, but those are the tough games because things get out of hand and you got to get into it right away and break it up, you know, pull them apart. Or we always tell the captains, if we have trouble with one of your players, we ask you that you send them out before we have to send them out. And it works, too, because a lot of times you'll hear the coach say, 52, get over here right now. You know, what are you saying to the official? You know, stuff like that to try to keep it down. How much do you think it helped um, being becoming an official uh, because you were a football player at Gibbons? Well, at a lot of times, I want to see them play football. You know, I'm not going to throw a flag on something cheap. I want to see them. I know how it is when you get hit. I know all that stuff, but I always want to see them play football. I want to, you know, see the game played, you know? So it's a lot different because when you get, sometimes you get people that didn't play ball and they have a different view of things. You know, everything's like ticky tacky, ticky tacky. But when you played football, you say, no, that's, he didn't, he didn't lay him down on the ground. You know, it was on a block in the back. He caught him on the side. Don't worry about it, you know, because the old rule used to be a block in the back was when the guy's face was planted on the turf. You know, that was a block in the back, you know. So 
you know, we really have to look at safety nowadays too. you know, player safety all the time. And when it comes to, you know, like I had a kid a couple of years ago, he said, after the play, I think it was the JV game. He said, he said, ref, he said, I'm, I'm dizzy. I said, well, by rule timeout, you have to go to the sidelines and get checked out because it could be a possible concussion. And as I'm walking off the field, the coach goes, he goes, Mike, the kid's always dizzy. I said, but we don't know that coach. We have to go on the idea that there's something wrong, you know? And, you know, the funny thing is, is kids don't, I mean, when we played, we had salt pills, you know, you'd take a handful and all water and everything. And normally you didn't get leg cramps and stuff. We had some now and then, but I think just in the spring, we've probably had 18 kids that went down with leg cramps because they don't start hydrating, you know, like on a Wednesday, they think that if the game's Friday night, they'll drink a lot Friday night and they'll be okay. And it doesn't work that way. You know, and I tell these kids, I said, if you get leg cramps, when you go home, the old school used to be pickle juice or mustard. If you take that within five minutes, your leg cramp is gone. But hydrate, please hydrate. And we constantly do that when we have a timeout. Like in the spring ball this year, we've given them more time to hydrate, to make sure they got water in them. Because kids, for some reason, don't understand that, you know, if you're playing and you're sweating, you're losing water, you know. Some officials opted not to referee in the spring here. Um, what was your thought and idea about you refereeing this spring during the pandemic and COVID times? Well, I, and I looked at it this way. I take all precautions. I mean, I don't, I don't live under a, a stone. I take care of my grandkids. I'm watching them. Uh, well, now they're finally uh, back to school on Monday, Tuesday. They Zoom on Wednesday, and they're back in school Thursday and Friday. But for the longest time, they only went Thursday, Friday. So I basically was watching them Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday on their Zoom meetings and stuff. But I wear my mask. I do what I'm supposed to do. I wash my hands. I don't put my hands in my eyes or this. And I got I got my vaccinations too. So before the season, I was vaccinated probably four weeks before the season started. We wear masks on the field. But, you know, Ed, to be honest, when you're running around and everything, you're pulling that mask down. You're blowing the whistle and stuff. Maybe pop it back on when you get near the kids. But you got to remember, all those kids don't have masks on. And they're right next to each other. You know, you got an offensive guy and you got a defensive guy less than a yard away from them. What are you going to do? You know, and it's funny because when they come to a game, there's like three buses because they got to be so many feet apart in the bus. But yet on the field, they're right next to each other. So, but again, you're outside, stuff like that. But the reason I did it, because I knew some of our guys didn't want to do it. And I figured I take all the safety precautions. I do everything I'm supposed to do. So I figured I was safe. And then once I got my vaccinations, I felt even better, you know, on being protected. We, we talked a, a lot about a, a lot of different things here today. What is, what is something you'd like to talk about that I haven't asked you? I think we've covered almost everything, Ed, really. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of games. I, I, and the good thing is I've met a lot of people through it. I've met a lot of coaches, um, you know, and players and stuff. I mean, every once in a while and, while we were doing this officiating, I used I I think I've refed in the JFK Touch League. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Buffalo. Sure. sure. They started it right after the president died, Kennedy. And we've worked probably maybe 20 years doing that on a Sunday morning, doing a couple of games and stuff. And we met a lot of guys there too, you know, people. And you you bump into them every once in a while. Hey, how you doing? You know, how's everything? Yeah, too bad you threw me out of that game. I said, well, you had it coming, you know. <laughs> But that's how you keep active, you know, and activity, you know, something in motion stays in motion. And as you get older, it's harder to get in motion, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Very true. Mike Fisker, I want to thank you so much. This was this was rather entertaining and, and very enjoyable. Thanks for joining me today on the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.